Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Praise the Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, and our sins, and save us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudate Jesus Christus. Jesus Christ is King. This is Timothy Flanders, the meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Trad Patrick. Patrick, how you doing, brother? Good. How are you? Doing excellent. Today's topic is the Christian corporate state. The Christian corporate state. That is the name of the anti-Nazi newspaper written by and edited by Dietrich von Hildebrand, funded by Dolphus of Austria. Mm -hmm. And it's also the central concept in fascism. Yep. And we're going to be talking about this concept and this history in this show today. So if you are uncomfortable with the fact that Trad Patrick is anonymous, try talking about this topic with a Marxist mob, and then you'll understand why uh, Mr. Patrick is anonymous. But before we get into the topic, Patrick, can you tell us about what are your credentials? Who are you to speak <laughs> about this topic of fascism? What, uh, tell me about what languages do you know? What have you studied? How long have you studied it? Okay, well, uh, I guess credential wise, uh, I can't say that I have a doctorate in political science or anything like that, but I do have uh, a, a degree in philosophy uh, uh, and theology and architecture. Uh, and during that time, I've, I've been a, a cradle Catholic. I learned many years ago when I unfortunately ended up uh, pretty much broke uh, many, many years ago. Uh, when my wife and I were first married, we ended up with nothing. And I got disgusted with the system. And this was about 20 years ago. And I started to research, if you would, the ideals of uh, economics and stuff. And it kept bringing me back to this idea of uh, fascism or corporatism, really, more or less. Uh, I started down the path of distributism, looking at distributism, looking at all these systems. And uh, what I did in the meantime, with, with my travels through work is I got to go over to places like Italy and Germany and France and actually meet with some of the uh, political parties that are affiliated with this uh, thought process. Uh, as far as languages, uh, Italian, German, some French. Um, not, I, I speak enough French to be dangerous, uh, but I do not speak fluent French. Um, Mostly it's uh, German and Italian, and I've read a lot of the texts uh, in German. Uh, like uh, Father Heinrich Pesch, I read uh, his opus magnus, if you would, of, of economics, which is essentially the corporate state uh, in, in the original German. Yeah, that's a, that's a central concept. And this is, I think, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but this seems to be one of the biggest straw men of sort of the liberal Austrian school is that they they prop up Hilaire Belloc and Chesterton as sort of the ideal, you know, anti-liberals, but it seems that Heidegger Pesch is really the guy they need to go after. Am I right? Absolutely. Um, the, the thing with the thing with Belloc and Chesterton, which I think a lot of people don't don't understand is distributism in and of itself is not an economic policy. It's not a political policy. It's it's a portion. Right. It's a little piece, but it has to belong to something else. Uh, so if you want to know what that something else that it has to belong to is, go read Pesh. Okay, so let's talk about what is, can you break down in three to five points, if you will, what exactly is the corporate state and is that the same as fascism? Okay, so the reason the corporate state gets affiliated with fascism is because Mussolini had famously stated that fascism should be instead called corporatism because it is a merger of the state and the corporations. But what he meant from that was what one of his advisors, Alfredo Rocco, who wrote basically the guiding principle of corporatism. And what he said in, in this uh, letter that he wrote was that corporatism is not so much a merging of the corporations with the state, but it is a merging and a restoration of a guild structure in which the worker, the manager, and the state, but by their definition, state did not mean Rome. It meant Naples, Bologna. It meant the individual areas where a particular business was, was located. And those 
elected officials would be part of the decision making process with the workers and the managers. So everybody was represented. And you came out of an arbitration, if you would, with an agreement that all three parties felt were beneficial to each other. And everybody was happy, right? So uh, what they're trying to restore is basically what the French Revolution got rid of, which is the guilds. And okay. that's, that's the, the, the main crux of corporatism. Okay, so it, it's, you're saying that it's dividing the society into these different estates, in a sense, whereas there's the, the workers and there's the managers, who, which in, in modern society would form up the union, or mm -hmm. the union rather would be the workers, obviously, uh, who would then come to the negotiation table with the managers. But you're saying that there's a third party in the corporate state, which is the local municipality, mm -hmm. the, the be mayor or whatever. Well, because in, in order for this to be really a, a system where the agreement is uh, legal, if you would, you'd have to have the state involved. But the state, again... Fascists don't want to, to rule from a central location, right? They don't want to be like DC runs everything. They, they want a subsidiarity. They want, they, they want that subsidiarity environment. They want to keep it as local as possible. So they break everything up. And uh, Oswald Mosley and um, the people that were working with him at the time really broke that structure down. And they said, okay, well, if we have agricultural uh, industry and agricultural guild, what falls under that heading of agriculture, right? Is the miller part of agriculture because they're taking the, the product that is grown and they're bringing it to its final solution. So those would fall into that bigger group, right? That bigger group is uh, agricultural, but then you have these smaller guilds underneath of it. And so you build this structure and everybody is represented. And there's no, so you're not going to stand inside of a curtain and vote for some faceless person you don't know, but the people that represented the workers were the people you worked with every day, right? You knew this guy. Uh, and so you said, look, we want you to represent us in the guild. The guilds in the medieval times were even stronger than that because they would actually have insurance policies. They would actually have uh, laws set in place uh, a lot of people have this understanding, uh, this modernist understanding of how things worked in the medieval times. But under the guilds, working men uh, were protected from every angle. So if you sent your child to be a, an apprentice blacksmith, right, usually like at, at the age of 11, uh, and he would apprentice for 10 years, he would, he would have to live under the blacksmith's roof. The blacksmith would have to provide him with food and clothing and all of these things. And as he came out of his apprenticeship, the blacksmith would have to offer him a job uh, or, and, and keep him under the roof until he was married, at which time the master would then have to go out and actually help him to procure his own land. So this was what the fascists, if you want to quote unquote, use that term, that's the type of system that they were looking back at and saying this was better because there was more harmony. Okay. So I, I, this is bringing one of the criticisms of fascism, which is that it negates subsidiarity. And that's why I want to get into the term totalitarian. But before I do that, can you nail down then what is the term fascism? Where does that come from? And what's the origin there? And do you do you use fascism synonymously with the corporate state of Heinrich Pesch? I, 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 number one, I use fascism because it's it's an over it, 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 it's like a governing top, right? So if you look at it, fascism's the philosophy, corporatism's the politics, uh, and then you have all these things like the guilds and all these things. Those are the policies that fall under it. The idea of fascism comes out the term actually came out of, uh, out, of, out of a Catholic priest in Italy uh, before, way before Mussolini uh, came into uh, being. And then of course you had uh, Giovanni Gentili who, who starts to use that term as well. But the, the priest, and his name is escaping me right now, I, I apologize for that, but he, um, he comes up with the original term of fascism. And Gentili, then Mussolini start to expand upon that uh, that ideal. But again, this is looking back at an, an, an 
almost all of the literature you'll read will point back to the social encyclicals preceding this uh, this time. Because most of these people are, uh, I, I hate to break everybody's uh, bad news here, but most of these people are Catholic. Yeah, so that's what we'll be getting into as to the um, Catholic nature of fascism, um, at least as the pious attempt, I think, I hope everyone can concede at least that there are pious Catholics trying to work through this system. So mm -hmm. whether you disagree or not, uh, we can at least give our brethren some sort of concession of, of uh, benefit of the doubt. I was just trying to find the, um, so the Italian term, I'm just, this is on Wikipedia, fancismo derives from fascio, meaning a bundle of sticks, ultimately mm -hmm. from the Latin fanches. So where, where does all this come from? Or what, what, what is this, the meaning of this, the term? What does bundle of sticks have to do with this philosophy? Okay, so that's, that's pointing back to the fascists, and the fascists is, of course, something that comes back to, to ancient Rome and everything like that. And so the idea is, right, if you take a single strand of, of hay, you can break it, right? But if you take them all together, a bundle of sticks, right? You take the bundle of sticks together, you wrap it with cord, you can't break it, right? It's impossible. But a single stick, a single strand of hay, you can snap. Pretty simple. So the idea is unification, right? It's bringing everybody together. Um, because if you're one person, you're going to fall, but if you're all together, you're going to stand stronger. And that's, uh, of course, that's coming out of Rome and, and, and to utilize the idea of the fascist, by the way, the fascist is actually the symbol for the national guard here in America. And the fascist hangs on both sides of both the house and the Senate, uh, uh, in the, uh, halls. Wow. That, that's interesting. Okay, so so fascist simply means bundle of sticks. Uh, a bundle of sticks, which is referring to the guild structure of uh, economic cooperation between these yep. different. Uh, so it seems to be attempting, at least at best, attempting to resurrect a cooperative structure, which is obviously in opposition to a very individualized economy that had prevailed out of England for hundreds of years at that point, which is trying to target the individual as a consumer and individuate everybody into an individual consumer uh, that can consume things. So go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, the, the idea of the economic system that you're talking about is obviously, uh, you know, that's a system that's contrary to to a corporative state. You can't have the system that we have today in a corporative state. You can't have it in a Catholic or a Christian corporative state. And, and Pesh lays that out pretty, pretty simply. Okay. So is, can you break down, is fascism totalitarian then? Because you're saying that it's, it's not, it is subsidiarity. It does not want to direct everything from on high. Can you speak to totalitarianism? Okay, so this is where you start to get into a lot of misdirected associations. The, the guy in Austria was not a fascist. He was a national socialist. Completely different system, uh, completely made up system, made up by him and, his, and, and, and the other members of his party. The system that he developed didn't exist anywhere else. It had no connection to the past. Uh, at all. And it didn't exist past him. It didn't live past him. It, it went away. It was, it was done. It was over. But the association was there. Why? Well, because he aligned himself with Mussolini. He aligned himself with Franco. He aligned himself with Cardano over in Romania and the Iron Guard. He, so he associated himself with a lot of these people and, and Philippe Baton and uh, Charles Morose, and, and he's associated with them. And so everybody says, well, he's a fascist too. But the problem was he wasn't. Uh, and most of the fascists pointed that out at the time and said, well, he's not, he's not one of us. But we're aligning with him because he has the biggest army. He has the money. He has all this stuff. And, we, and you know, war makes strange bedfellows, right? Uh, so that's where, that, that's where the whole idea of the Dinesh D'Souza uh, world of explaining fascism comes from. It's, oh, it's totalitarian. It's left wing. It's this and that. Um, it's not. 
Uh, matter of fact, if you actually look at, at some of the newspaper articles and some of the teachings and stuff, uh, Belloc wrote a great book called The Cruise of the Nona. And, and in the book, he's, it's actually talking about how he took his boat, he went over, and he actually uh, hung out with Mussolini. Uh, and he admired him. Uh, he admired him greatly. As a matter of fact, even uh, Gandhi had stated that Mussolini was this great statesman, right? Very misunderstood guy. He's a great statesman. He's all these things. But even Bella comes out to say, this is not totalitarian. He's not controlling what's going on in, in, in Palermo. He's not controlling what's going on in, in Tuscany. Uh, but what he's doing is he's ruling on high, and then these individual places are actually doing the day-to-day -day stuff. And he's the guy who's kind of just holding it together. So it's, it's really a modernist interpretation. It's part of the lie of, of what I would say would be the 20th century. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to get into uh, the Austrian painter, painter turned uh, Nazi leader, Fuhrer, whatever. We're going to get into that as that's one of the biggest critiques. I want to ask you further a little bit more about the philosophy. You're saying that, uh, so what I hear you saying is that the fascist leader, like Mussolini or whoever, is essentially liberating the local rights of the cities to cooperate outside of a, a pressure from other international businesses or bigger businesses, perhaps. Is that what you're trying to get at here? They... I like to use the term the international financiers, right? They they are liberating their nation from the the influence of the international financiers. Uh, Italy Italy largely escapes the entire Great Depression, right? And there's two reasons why. One, the corporative state. Two, Italy at, at the time and even to today, Italy was never a very industrialized nation, right? It wasn't this overly industrial nation. Same thing with Spain, right? Spain's not really known for being this mecca of industrialization, right? So they escape the depression. Spain's having its own problems with the civil war, but economics, they're not really having an issue with. They're not really having a depression. They're not influenced by it at all. And there's a couple of reasons. It's not just the corporate state. It's not just the, the, the uh, level of industrialization, but it's the rejection that they had in these areas of this centralized banking, this uh, influence from international finance and international trade. Uh, people like Mosley, for example, come out and they explain that one of the reasons that you really start to see this, uh, this destruction, if you would, of nations is that they're, they're, too, they're too concerned. They're overly concerned with what goes on outside of their borders versus uh, uh, what happens inside right so if you if you take it like this right fascism says i can't be concerned about what happens in in germany right unless it's directly affecting me i have to worry about my people okay i have to worry about what's happening here in italy and i have to make sure that the italian people are fed the entire italian people are clothed and they're working and mosley lays this out very well and he says we don't need to import anything because we can we we have enough resources here in the UK to take care of the, the the people of the UK without ever bringing anything in. But we may want to at some point, in which case you have another guild. You have a trade guild and that trade guild then negotiates that trade to the best benefit. So the trade guild says, look, I'm going to buy uh, olive oil from you, Italy. I'm going to buy a thousand dollars a month but you have to buy $1,000 a month of my product, whatever that is, right? And if you drop below that $1,000, I'm going to drop below that $1,000. So it's, it's reciprocal, right? That's, that's really the economic policy, and that's where you're really getting to all that inside of fascism. So is it, can you talk about the idea of, because I'd, I'd always heard of Pesh, the main work that you can have access to if you're not rich, is um, national econ ethics in the national economy, mm -hmm. which I, as I understand him there, he's essentially saying that the wealth of the nation must stay, must be for the nation. The wealth and mm -hmm. the economy of the nation must serve the nation itself, serve the people itself. Whereas the international economy is essentially these international businesses 
which are uh, a lots of elites that have employees all over the world who are basically, uh, so the, the country's sort of, country's economy become subservient to an international economic structure rather than their own national economy for their own people. Is that? Yeah, well, uh, Pesh, Pesh was, a, Pesh was a, a, when you get into Libertas, he really goes, he really goes into more uh, in depth on, on, on that uh, process. And he states, look, if, if you have an industry that's in your country, right? Let's just say America, for example, let's say we have uh, Amazon. Amazon is created here in America. Uh, Bezos is an American citizen, all these things, right? In the idea of Pesh, in the idea of fascism is that Bezos should maintain the wealth of Amazon inside the borders of this nation because this nation has given him the opportunity uh, to, to create this industry. And if he takes that outside of it, then the people of this nation suffer while others are enriched. And that's the, the idea of America as a whole. If you look at America's system, Pesh would absolutely say if he was alive today that America's system uh, is, is corrupt because what does America's system do? It allows you to take your industry, outsource all the work of your industry to another nation, thus enriching that nation, but taking away the jobs and the, the, the money and everything from your own home nation. So it's, uh, that's where fascism is really 100% in line with Pesh, which is also, by the way, in line with uh, Quandrissimo Anno, Rem Novarum. They're all in, in the same line. And even if you want to talk about another one, we could talk about uh, Father, Father Tapparelli is really kind of pushing this same idea too. And he's probably one of the people that ghost wrote Rem Novarum, by the way. Okay. Yeah, I've heard that... Um... It was the von, German Bishop von Kettler that it was a huge influence on Ray Navarro and then Pesh on Quedro J. Mm -hmm. Um So what about the philosophy in terms of more than economics? You mentioned to me when we talked privately about faith and fatherland, family, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, can you break down more of the social philosophy of fascism? So I, I've, I've said this a couple of times. So the, the, the guiding philosophy of fascism is three F's, faith, family, father, land. You can't use that terminology, all right? If you use that terminology, you end up like me and you have to sit behind a mask and you have to keep your name quiet uh, because people don't like to hear that because it drums up something that you're, you're not supposed to have. But let's take fatherland. The Catholic church teaches us that we're supposed to be, we're supposed to love our nation. That doesn't mean we have to love the government of the nation, but we have to love our nation. And that means we have to protect our nation. We have to protect our nation economically. We have to protect our nation from, from uh, foreign influence. We have to protect our nation from, from even immigration. Even immigration, I, I, the, the church used to teach that you know, too much immigration is not good, that it actually uh, offsets the balance of both, both nations. So for the land's big. And even with these fascists, even with these people, fatherland is big. They, they have this great love for their nation, which, of course, got misunderstood by some people. So some people said, well, they want to put the state above the church. Now, James Starkey Barnes, he comes in, he writes, he, he wrote a book uh, about fascism uh, while he was uh, the undersecretary of uh, international affairs for Mussolini. Barnes was not even a uh, full Italian. He was Indian and English. So the idea that there's this like hatred for anybody that's not of that type uh, is wrong because here's this evidence that, you know, that's not true. And Barnes even goes further to say, we're not putting ourselves above the church, that in issues of morality, the church should hold absolute authority. But in terms of certain issues of the state, while the church can guide it, the state must make the ultimate decision. That's completely in line with what uh, Leo the Thirteenth said in Immortality Day. So there's there's that portion now. So now we're we're past that. Now we get into faith. As I said, Salazar, Franco, Dolfus, uh, Philippe Tan, uh, Charles Maru, all. Catholic, right? You have a few outliers. Oswald Mosley was not Catholic. Uh, he was an Anglican. Uh, um, Quadrino over in Romania was Eastern Orthodox. But um, 
for the most part, most of these people are Catholic. So of course, there's there's a large faith structure. Rocco is Catholic. James Starkey Barnes is Catholic. Most of the, the party officials under Mussolini were Catholic. Mussolini was raised and baptized Catholic. He came back to the church uh, at the end. He did have, uh, look, I, I could tell you that there's people that have all kinds of sin. He, he did have sinful things. He, he, was, a, he was a womanizer. Um, that was a, a, a big problem for him, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe he was addicted to, to that, uh, that thing. But they're looking at faith. Faith is very important. It's guiding their principles. Mussolini is the one who gave Rome, uh, gave the Vatican essentially back to the church, right? He gave them all the money that they lost when they lost the papal states. That's Mussolini at the Fourth Laterno Council doing that. S lastly, is family. Fascists look at family as, as being one of the most important parts of a nation. Uh, you, you, you hear people like Quadrino or Mussolini or anybody talking about family. They're explaining to you that a nation is nothing if it's not the people of the nation. Look at Hungary. 25 years ago, Hungary was in a, let's just say, they would have been extinct, right? There would have been no native born uh, Hungarians. You got a guy who comes into office essentially taking a very fascist uh, direction with his nation. Today, it has the highest birth rate and the highest marriage rate and the highest, the lowest rate, excuse me, of divorce in Europe because he's taking this very fascist stance. He's leading his nation in a very fascist way because what is he doing? He's going back to the same thing a lot of the fascists were doing, which is saying, you need to have children. You need to have families. You need to take care of your families. And in order to do that, your wife needs to stay home. And in order to do that, you need money. And a lot of these nations, and Hungary's doing it right now, uh, said, look, you know, we're going to give you a, a loan that you don't have to pay back. Now, of course, this got really uh, bad press because that certain particular failed painter uh, he did the same thing, and so everybody associates it with him, but this was going on throughout large portions of, of Europe at the time after World War I. Why? <laughs> because half of the people were killed. Right. True. So, so family is a big defining factor of the philosophy of fascists, whereas you look here at America, it's not, right? We don't, we don't care. You don't want to have kids. You want to live in sin. You want to do all these things. You go ahead and do it. I don't care. That's America. Mm -hmm. So certainly faith, fatherland, and uh, family, certainly Catholic principles. Now, could does a Catholic need to be fascist? Can a Catholic be a monarchist or some kind of Christian Republican? Uh, I, why, why do they need to be a fascist? I have – this is a, a misconception. I have no issue with monarchy. My issue with monarchy is the LARP, right? We're America. <laughs> Where are you getting this king from? Are you going to go and like plant the seed in the ground, water it for a couple of days, and up pops a king? We don't have an ar aristocratic class in America, okay? So now you have to take that uh, aristocratic family or whatever that you want to groom. And I've stated it would take at least 100 years. OK, because you would probably be looking at 10 generations before you finally got that that aristotic uh, aristocratic, excuse me, uh, teaching into them. That's what you would need. Even in Europe, the, the aristocracy is dead. It's gone. Most of the most of the monarchs in, in Europe and everything, they're pretty much nothing more than, uh, you know, public relations uh, people. They're not really kings. They're not really uh, queens. The, the only one you can really point to is over in Jordan, the king of Jordan. He's real. He's really a king. Okay? And he's out there and he's fighting in wars, um, uh, you know, on the front line. So, I mean, this guy is a king. But they're very few and far between by today's society. Of course, a lot of Catholics like to go, well, we got the Habsburgs. Uh, I don't know if you've really taken a good hard look, but there's, there's some problems with that family too uh, today. Not saying that they can't be fixed. I'm just saying that in order to get to where you got to go, you need a stepping stone. And fascism, by the way, even Mussolini admitted, was never a system that was meant to be in place forever. Mussolini's ultimate goal was to restore the, the Roman uh, style of, of uh, governance. 
he that's why he was doing Roman architecture. He's doing all this stuff is because he's really looking back to that and saying, well, that lasted a long time for a lot of reasons. It fell for a lot of reasons, but we can address those reasons later on. But the idea of fascism was never to say we're going to live under fascism forever. Franco was the same, right? Eventually, Franco st stood down. Uh, Franco's biggest mistake was who he picked to be the king. It was a, a, a big mistake there. But they never wanted to be ultimate power. Matter of fact, Mussolini, for the first 15 years he's in power, is serving under the king. So I don't have a problem with any of those systems, but you have to be realistic about them, right? Like you said, Christian Republican, <sighs> yeah, Catholic Republic. I, I, I can't, I can't wrap my head around that that idea because, especially here in America, I, I just think it's inconceivable. Okay, so let's talk historically, because it seems to me that fascism arises from purely a political standpoint as as a cultural movement which is reacting against marxism uh, or the the encroachment of marxism through dem through democratic means using electoral processes to impose all sorts of marxist things the areas of russia pornography sexual revolution what have you etc mm -hmm. trying to continue to spread this revolution and the fascists arise as a reaction to that because, and, and the people go along with them because the people by and large are not Marxists because the Marxists are just these elites trying to manipulate everybody. So the people go along because they're just, uh, they're just adhering to their customs and their, their faith and their traditions. And they see a strong man who can beat back the Marxists. And if it means setting aside some democratic processes, which the Marxists have been abusing anyways, so be it. Is that a fair estimation of what's going on in a broad historical stroke? Fascism is first and foremost a counter-revolutionary ideology, right? It is, it is really any place it's any place it's been adopted has almost fallen, right? So you look at you look at France, you look at Spain, you look at Portugal, you look at Italy, you look at all these places, Ro Romania, they they've fallen, right? They they've they they're given in to complete deviancy and degeneracy, and largely, like you said, you got to give up some some democratic uh, freedoms or liberties or whatever you want to say, right? But honestly, when we look at those things that we'd give up, are, are we really sacrificing anything? If, if I said to you, if I said to you today, Tim, if I come into power, I'm going to restore a guild structure. I'm going to look inward to the country. I'm going to make sure all Americans are working. I'm going to lower uh, immigration into the nation. I'm going to have the church guiding uh, the morality and decency. I'm going to end abortion and all this. But you have to give up porn. You have to give up, uh, I don't know, something. Uh, you have to give up drugs, whatever, right? Some, some ridiculous thing that you don't want anyway. What are you really giving up? You're not really giving up anything. And, and, and contrary to what a lot of people thought, Mussolini, for example, was a journalist. He never suppressed the media. What he said to the media in Italy, which was the same thing that Mosley was saying, is if you print an article that is false, the state can come after you for that. I don't see a problem with that. Now, could it be, could it be abused? Absolutely. Absolutely, it can be abused, right? But what do we have here in America today? Do we really have a free press or is the press completely liberal? Can you go after the press? Can I go after the press if they slander me? No, they're protected. So what the fascists said, the, the liberty that got taken away was the fact that they, they could not be sued. Now they could be. So if they attacked you and said, Tim Flanders is a, a, a meanie, you could go back and say, well, that's not true. I'm a really nice guy. I'm going to sue you. Okay. So that's, I mean, I, I mean, that's the ridiculous argument that everybody has. It's like, well, I got to give up this freedom. Like what freedom are you giving up? Porn? Suppressing porn is a bad idea. I've, I've actually heard Catholics say this to me, that suppressing porn is a bad idea because it's suppressing freedom of speech. Because they don't understand what freedom of speech is. And originally, the idea of freedom of speech was only that you had the ability to talk out against the government. That's it. 
Not that the government couldn't suppress certain forms of speech because they do it every day. So what about the, in, in the idea of loss of some sort of freedom? Isn't there, I mean, aren't you romanticizing it a little bit? Isn't, I mean, weren't some of these leaders quite harsh, violent even, uh, bloodshed in the streets to suppress these elected officials of some kind? I mean, wasn't there some harshness that you're overlooking here? Sure, sure. Is it any different today? Is, is politics today any cleaner or nicer? No. No, it's not. Matter of fact, we could just talk about what just happened, right? Democratically, America was kind of stabbed in the back, completely bad. There, there was riots. There's been riots going on in America for over a year now. But we don't talk about that. We don't act like that's a problem. Now, was number one, Mussolini, by the way, <laughs> he actually arrested his own fascist party members when they would go out and perform acts of violence because he didn't believe that acts of violence randomly politically were good. Matter of fact, the only guy who ended up getting brutally killed was Mussolini. There were some, there were some arrests, but they were communists. And if you're going to tell me that arresting communists, kicking communists out of your country or, 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 Putting down, uh, you know, communist revolutions is a bad thing. I'm going to disagree with you. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you 100. percent And a matter of fact, I'll go further. A lot of people go, he was anti-Semite. No, he wasn't. One, at least two of his main generals were Jewish. They were his main advisors, uh, uh, sitting at the war table with him. I, I'll go even further. That he was so not a racist. When Italy had control of Ethiopia, Mogadishu, Somalia, go and look at the pictures. They look like beautiful Roman cities. They're beautiful. Mussolini's out there with these people, shaking hands, hanging out with them. If he was this evil racist, why is he doing that? Why would he be doing that? Why would he be propping up these nations in Africa, building them up, giving them money from, from, from Rome, because a lot of this stuff is lied about the entire, I, I would say the entirety of the early 20th century is a complete and utter fabrication of the academic class. So what about, you just mentioned Mussolini. I mean, doesn't he invade Ethiopia with mustard gas? That's, that doesn't seem like a, sound like a kind benevolent ruler to me. <laughs> so un, let's understand why is so, so Italy lost that area. After World War One, right? It was it was it was an occupied territory of theirs. Uh, prior to that time, it was taken by the Allies, uh, and and we're going to war, right? Let's be honest, Tim. We're going to war. We, uh, America doesn't do this. I was in the military. I can tell you for a fact we do. I I I I, I well, yeah, certainly certainly I I I don't disagree. I mean, I but I, I don't I don't disagree that the American Empire is guilty of all sorts of things. I'm simply saying. If we're evaluating fascism on its own merits, all, how do you explain that? All government goes to war. All governments go to war. All governments do bad things in war. Matter of fact, America dropped two nuclear bombs on the two most Catholic cities in, in all of Japan. That's Can true. you justify that? No, you can't. I'm not going to justify war, that. War, for the most part, war in the modern era is completely unjustifiable. Now, I'll take a step back from that, and I'll say – are they just wars? Yes. By the definition that, uh, that, that St. Augustine puts out there, every war we've had in the modern era is justified. The tactics may not be. I mean, if you want to go back to, if you want to go back to a, 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 a good way of war fighting, let's, let's take all the guns, let's take all the tanks, let's take all the warships, let's melt them down and make swords and maces and you know, go and fight like men. But unfortunately... We live in a society that wants to go to these tech, technological, you know, peaks, and we not only want to create new ways to like keep us glued to the TV, but we also want to create new ways to kill people, right? So that's uh, that's an unfortunate thing, but you can't say, well, fascism did this, so it's bad, 
And then you just forget about everything that America did. You forget everything that let, let's talk about Russia. Let's talk about communists. Let's talk about how many people they killed with not one single weapon other than going out, stealing all their food, insulting the earth so that they couldn't make anything. Yes. So Here, here's another <laughs> objection. Now, isn't fascism the worship of the state, the idolatry of the ruler? Um, shouldn't be we be working towards the Catholic confessional state? Most of, the, most of them had a Catholic confessional state. Salazar did. Franco did. Um, Dolphus probably would have had one if he wasn't assassinated. Um, Leon de Grel probably would have had one if he didn't have to go into exile. Um, I mean, Mussolini, toward the end, he probably would have had one himself if he hadn't been, you know, killed. The same thing with Patan and others. They, I mean, we know of a fact that there's quite a few confessional states under fascist leaders. We know that for a fact. Even if we go back before the modern interpretation of fascism and we go back to Garcia Moreno, he has a confessional state. And for all intents and purposes, he's a fascist without the name. So let's uh, now <clears throat> let's talk about Adolf Hitler, the <laughs> Austrian painter. So you're saying that he's a pagan, basically. Oh, yeah. he's, he's not a fascist. Now, is Dolphus, oh, just for viewers, this is what I learned from Dietrich von Hildebrand's bi biography that I really recently, recently read, is that, so the, the Christian corporate state was this anti-Nazi newspaper. So Dietrich von Hildebrand understood what Hitler was doing. He fled Germany to Austria. He hooked up with Dolphus. Uh, what was his first name? Albert. Albert, thank you. Albert Dolphus, who's the chancellor of Austria. And Dolphus funds... Dietrich von Hildebrand's anti-Nazi newspaper, which mm -hmm. is called the corporate Christian corporate state, which is then, which then makes, makes von Hildebrand public enemy number one of the Nazis. So you have, and Dolphus then is also seizing power because he's facing Marxist revolution and also Nazi revolution in his own country. So he's trying to seize power and suppress all these revolts. And that's why he gets called a fascist. So is Dolphus a fascist in your mind? Politically and ideologically and economic, well, politically and ideology, yes. Economically, no. Why? Who's running the economy for Dolphus? Mises. Oh, of course. It's Austrian, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So Austria is under the Austrian School of Economics, straight up. Uh, you know, the grandfather of it, Mises, is there. And Mises actually kind of is one of the reasons that Dolphus falls, in, in my mind. Interesting. Um, because his, uh, his openness to, to trade and influence and everything else really kind of weakens Dolphus to, to a large degree. But Dolphus is – politically and ideologically he he is fascist he believes in that same those same principles uh unfortunately he just picks some some uh some bad people to surround him but you're absolutely right right he's looking at he's looking at uh the crazy guy his his fellow austrian and he's saying this guy's off the rails right he, he initially has this great idea he takes this great idea and he goes nuts so why is is dolphus the the only "Quote unquote fascist to really oppose Hitler." Mm. So Mussolini famously said that Hitler was an idiot. Uh, he famously said, "Look, this guy's an amateur. Uh, he's not very bright, and uh, you know he's just kind of he's just kind of coming out and he's kind of saying a lot of really bad things about Hitler." And <laughs> he turns around and, and people say, "Well, don't don't align with him. Don't align with him." But he doesn't have much choice, right? Same thing with Franco. Franco doesn't have much choice. Franco's just about losing the war uh, over in Spain, right? He's just about depleted. He's just about losing to the to the communists. So Franco needs the help, right? And he needs the help from these guys, and so they reach out to him. But it, he's not. They're not the only fascists that that said anything. Uh, Salazar. Uh, in Salazar's case, he doesn't even want to be affected with any of these people, right? Salazar wants to be completely independent. He wants to be Switzerland. He's not getting involved in the war. He's not aligning with any of these people. And he's actually saying, look, you know, that guy over there, he's nuts. 
I don't, I don't want to be associated with him. I don't want to know him. Uh, he's, he's insane. Are there others that are agreeing with him? Sure. There are. Um, I think what's happening at that time is things are so bad, right? They're so bad in Europe. The, the, the international financiers, the, 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 the free marketeers and everybody else have, have really just, they've destroyed the morality and the decency and the, in the culture of Europe at this point, right? They've just between world war one and world war two, they've just completely demoralized these people. And, and you, you do have good people who've just, you know, they look at this guy and they go, it's better than the alternative, right? It's kind of like America, right? What do we do every four years? We go, I don't like either one of them, but that guy's better than the other guy, right? We're, we're, what do we do in America? Let's be honest. Every four years, we vote for who's going to be our dictator. That's it. So in, in, in this case with these people, they, they kind of viewed him as, I don't really like him. Kind of think he's an idiot, but what's the alternative? Churchill? Roosevelt? No Stalin. thanks. Stalin? No, thanks. I don't, I don't want nothing to do with those guys. And, and, and you bring up a great point because what does America and Britain do? Hey, right. uncle Joe ally with Stalin. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's I, it's I, hard to, yeah, it's hard to point the finger at these fascists. If, if we're going to align with Stalin. It's no, exactly. Tough. And that's, that's the point that I argue with everybody else. I said, and, and, and I actually got into this discussion with Dinesh D'Souza and he says to me, well, we picked the lesser of two evils. I said, really? Would you like to tell that to the victims of the Holmador? Because I don't think they would agree with you. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's it's hard to really say who's more evil. They're both great evils causing great destruction and, and loss of life and uh, 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 attacking again, the faith. Yeah. Everybody is. Every, everybody is. Like, I, if we put together, if I put together a number right now, of the amount of people that America has killed in 200 years versus 2,000 years of Europe, guess who's going to be higher? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a very important point that Americans need to face up to because we are an empire and we have been since we invaded Canada in 1812, et cetera. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're, we are an empire and we've always wanted to be an empire and we function as an empire and we kill we people. We owned like Mexico. We owned Mexico for three days. A lot of people don't know that, but we owned Mexico for three days. It was actually the Congress who was like, no, no, no just give it back. We don't want to. <laughs> you mean after the Mexican-American War? Yeah. Right. I didn't know how much we owned. I thought we just took the Southwest and left no, no. the rest. Well, nope. we talked. We, we did end up taking the Southwest and le left the rest, but. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, so Dolfus, um, he opposes Hitler, he is killed for it mm -hmm. by Nazis. The Nazis in then invade Austria in 1938. This is the, I don't know if you agree. I, I view this as the fulfillment of Fatima because Fatima says the war will break out under Pius XI. And that's what happened in Pius XI, which is the invasion of Austria. Um, but uh, we taught, we you've touched a, a bit on Mussolini. Now there's also, so we've meant, you've mentioned Franco Pétain, uh, there's also Duplessis over in Quebec, Salazar. Mm -hmm. These are all people who are called fascists. I don't know how much they live up to the ideal of fascism that you're saying. So any other thinkers you'd like to mention on in more detail? Well, you've got the Brazilian integralists who, who are 100% in line. Uh, you have Perón down in Argentina, right? Um, you've got the Mexican integralists. Right? A lot of it, a lot of people don't really realize that integralism is really just an offshoot of fascism. So a lot of these people are very, very akin to the idea of fascism. They're very, uh, they're kind of like right there with each other, right? They kind of say, okay, well, we agree on most, most things that you agree on. So we can be friends and we can be allies. A lot of South America at this time has a lot of the integralist movements in South America are huge at this time. Huge. But of course, America gets involved. Let's go back to America. What does it do? It's like, oh, no, 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 you're not going to do that. We need cheap labor. Smash. Um, and so those those groups go underground. Um, as I said, I mentioned the Iron Guard over in Romania. Um, 
again, very, uh, very pro fascist uh, state there. Uh, not Catholic again, they're, they're Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox makes sense. They're Romanian. Um, but even like all these integralists that I just mentioned, they're all, um, they're all Catholic. And, and, and the problem with integralism is the same, the same problem that distributism has. They both get a bad rap because left-wing lunatics like to glam on to both of these things. The left-wing lunatics that like to go, oh, integralism is like the Chinese government is so integralist. It's so amazing. Like Jose Mina is one of these idiots. And uh, they find out, you know, Thomas Crean writes a book about integralism and they, and they just about lose their, they, they, they just about lose their lunch because here's Crean coming along and saying, well, if you have an integralist state, you have to be a native to the country and you have to be Catholic or you can't run for office. And he's absolutely right. Every one of these people we just mentioned was the same way. They all said, when, and I'm going to, I'm going to butcher uh, the French here. And so Kennedy's going to yell at me later. Um, but uh, 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 what was it? Uh, Action Francois, right? Oh yeah. Action Francais. Yeah. 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 They, uh, <laughs> they're, they're pretty much saying the same thing. You got to be Catholic. You got to be Catholic or you can't have any part of this. Now, here's an objection because Action Francais was suppressed. And the reason it was suppressed was because its philosophy by uh, Charles Moulin was politics first. It was trying to formulate a Mm -hmm. political system to impose on a society which would fix everything instead of saying spirituality is first. The gospel is first. The church is first. And that is the transformative power of society. And the state is then directed as well by the church. But it seems to be that the politics first, that that's the key of, of Action Francais. So the objection, the objection is, isn't, isn't fascism doing the same thing? Okay. This is an objection. I love, and I love to talk about it. Spirituality in the church. Let's go to immortality day. Let's read. Pope Leo XIII's uh, own words. The church has a place, and even fascists believe this, and even even, uh, Charles felt the same way. The church has a place. Number one, that's morality, and that's spirituality, right? Those those should be guiding principles of the church upon the state. Where they all differed, and I kind of agree with this, especially when you look at America, is – Politics. Politics have to be, they have to be done on a political scale. But if everybody in the politics is Catholic, okay, so let's just say everybody in politics is Catholic and the Catholic Church is guiding the morality, then what's the problem of saying that the politics have to take precedent of the politics and the church takes precedent on the spiritual and the the moral, right? Now, the church would say it's, it's the same thing. Right. Pope Leo said the same thing. He said we shouldn't get involved in certain things like uh, trade or this or that. That should be uh, an avenue of the state. But the church can help to make those decisions. The church can say, hey, well, you know, uh, instead of going down to, let's say, Mexico and, you know, completely burning down the rainforest and and strip mining the whole thing and then building strip malls and and, uh, Starbucks. Maybe you should look at that from a different avenue and, and say, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that. That's that's what a lot of these people are saying, that here's where the church can say, hey, we can give a little guidance uh, and stuff like that on those issues. But on the political issues, the political issues have to be handled as a political entity. Otherwise, you have a completely different system. What system do you have? You have a theocracy. And the problem with a theocracy, especially when you're talking about places like maybe in France, it would have worked at the time. But a theocracy in America, it's never going to work. You'd be lucky if that if that government would last a month. Right. Why? Well, because Catholics are really a minority. When you add up all the different nine bajillion uh, different versions of Protestantism, they dwarf us. Right. They're going to sit there and go, we're not going to be a Catholic nation. That's ridiculous. That's insane. But you can have 
a Catholic nation without calling it a Catholic nation. And that's really kind of what these people are trying to do. It's kind of like on the down low a little bit. Hey, we're Catholic, but we're not going to come out and say we're Catholic. Because if we do that, then we're going to have problems. So why introduce the problems if we don't need to? So again, I kind of agree with that direction a little bit, right? Because especially in modern times, the idea of a theocracy is not going to go over well. And, and I love the LARPy people who are like, the whole thing is going to be taken over by the Catholic Church. No offense. I don't want to live in a government that's run by Pope Francis. Just don't want to do it. Okay. I, I honestly, I don't, I don't want to have a governorship of Bishop Barron. I don't want to have a, 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 a Senator Jimmy Martin. I, I don't want that, but I do want the morality of the church. I do want the spirituality of the church. I do want those guiding principles of the faith, but right now the leadership of the faith, I don't want them running the, the nation. But I would like to have people who look at those other things and say, let me incorporate those things into the church, into the government, excuse me. Let's talk about Franco, um, because this is where the, the church gets involved very much. Um, you have the movement of Carlism, which is a very strong Catholic counter-revolutionary movement. Now, if what you're saying is true, why didn't the Carlists and Franco join hands and uh, be perfectly united? Why was there so much tension between these two parties? It's hard, it, it, it's hard to really get to, to drive down. I mean, Stanley Payne kind of lays out the, the reasoning for it. There's the Carlists really wanted more power. Franco didn't want to release the power to them. Uh, Frank, you got to understand Franco's point of view, right? He just came off of fighting communists right and, and brutal brutal communists just people who are doing the worst things and he kind of viewed a lot of the the carlists and a lot of other people as kind of almost fence sitters to a degree right they they, they didn't really want to get involved the way he did they didn't really want to push back and he feared what he feared from them was that given the opportunity for them to have any any extent of power would open the door to some of these, these, you know, these bad ideologies, these bad morals, these bad philosophies and stuff to kind of weasel their way back in. And he's kind of vindicated in that, right? When he, when he relinquishes power and everything like that, what happens? Spain just completely plummets. It falls to the ground and it becomes a, a socialist. I want to talk about that. Um, the, uh, so after World War II, there seems to be a worldwide shift. I mean, really the allies take over. So the American empire versus the Soviet empire. Mm -hmm. And how does this, how does the discrediting of fascism, if, if, if we just accept what you're saying and say, okay, we, we're just going to grant that this may be an imperfect system, but we're going to grant that all these pious Catholics were trying their best in a terrible situation, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, what does the what is this this shift away from fascism? How does that affect the church going into the fifties and sixties with the Vatican II? I think I think the idea uh, is absolutely that the church wants to it wants to put away any any ties it has to that because if it has any ties to that at all, it impedes them from their marching toward this modernist church, right? This rebuilding, if you would, of the Catholic church uh, into this, this modernist, uh, uh, you know, faith that we have today. And they need to, they need to get away from that. And they're doing it. Matter of fact, they're doing it during world war II, right? This is where you're really seeing uh, people like uh, Crowley, is starting to have a lot of influence on, on particular cardinals and bishops. Crowley's really kind of coming up. He's getting a lot of backing from certain uh, clergy members that Wh are which one is Which one is Crowley? Alistair oh. Crowley. Alistair oh, Crowley. That was, Crowley. Yes. What? <laughs> yes. I, you did not know that, huh? Crowley no, I, I mean, I, I know about it. Uh, I know about his, his influence in general. But yep. I didn't know he was having direct influence on cardinals in the 40s. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, there's two very famous ones that, that we know for a fact were Masons that had a lot of uh, uh, 
dealings with with Crowley. And a matter of fact, he's known to be over there in 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 Switzerland. He's known to be there. Yeah, he's in Saint Gallen. I know that was one of yes. his his cult worship sites or whatever. Um, and, and remember just, the name of his remember the name of his mass is the Gnostic Catholic Mass. Yeah, and just just so just for viewers' sake, Aleister Crowley was the most famous Satanist probably of the 20th century. He had a religion called Thelema, which was the religion of do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Wow. Many, lots of popular rock music loves him. He's on the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Cards Club band, all this insanity. So that's Aleister Crowley. Um, so he he has an interesting connection that that you were bringing up with the St. Gallen because that's one of his sites and he has this wicked right of the anti-mass. So who were and so were who are the who were the cardinals connected with Crowley during the forties? Well, we 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 know one uh, for a fact, and I I can't I can't remember his name right now. It's okay, of course. I'll get it later. Uh, uh, I'll get it to you later. But we know one for a fact who who's who's very famously known to be a a a mason. Uh, we know, a matter of fact, at this point, this is also where the church is starting to kind of have a difference of opinion on on, on masonry, by the way. Uh, if we get to, matter of fact, if we get to a little bit further from this point, a little bit further after World War II, uh, what do we get uh, right about the time Vatican II is coming into, into being is Archbishop Fulton Sheen is saying, well, it's not really what the church is saying about masons. It's just saying if your particular lodge of masonry is not affecting the church, is not attacking the church, well, then you could be a mason. That's fine. Because it's that influence going back. And so what do these people want to fight? They want to fight the one group of people who had literally stood up, the one group of people literally stood up and said, these guys here, these stone cutters, there's a lot of problems with these guys. And we have to outlaw it. So Mussolini outlaws it. Franco outlaws it. Uh, mustache man outlaws it. Um, it's outlawed in all these places. They 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 tear down the, the the shrines. They tear down the temples. They tear down the lodges. They get rid of it. But here's this this outcrying again. Here's this guy, this elusive character. He's actually, by the way, a double agent for Britain. So he goes in and pretends to be a, a fascist, but then is going back to Britain and telling them all the information so that they can go after and attack the fascists. Why? Because he's a Mason. He hates the fascists. Who's the double agent you're talking about? Crowley? Yep. Okay. It's famous. He's a famous double agent for the British. Yeah. It is interesting because the allies in world war II are either Masonic or communists. It's basically mm -hmm. the Masonic communist Alliance, which are the allies and the axis is obviously neo-paganism and certain fascist powers to a degree um okay so we've got uh the influence of a reaction to fascism mm -hmm. so is this because the um i know with archbishop lefebvre and the chetus internationalibus patrum not saying that correctly but that's the alliance that lefebvre makes at the council as sort of a vanguard against the European alliance of the Northern European powers. Mm -hmm. um, now they're coming from the, the bishops that are coming and imposing on Vatican II the, the revolution that they're doing are from France, Germany, um, Belgium, Netherlands. Um, what, what, what effect do you see of sort of an anti, anti, anti fa uh, mindset here. Well, I think again, it goes back to it goes back to the lie of the 20th century, right? The entire 20th century is an academic rewrite of the true history of the uh, of, of the the prior hundred years, right? Academia has decided that they're going to spin the narrative, they're going to create the narrative, and the narrative is is that if if you're told you can't be uh, let me use terms that that won't get you in trouble. If you say you want to be a, a, a Volkswagen and you want to identify as a Volkswagen and that's what you are. And if somebody tells you you can't, that person's a fascist because they've, they've now impeded upon your liberty, your fraternity, your equality. Where are these things coming from? The French Revolution. Who's the French Revolution? The Masons. So see, it all it all keeps continuing down this 
this idea. So if you tell the American people, and the American people pretty much are the, the worst on this, right? If you go to Europe, the Europeans are much more aware. You actually have fascist parties in a lot of European countries today that actually hold uh, offices uh, in these countries. But here in America, we, we've instilled a lot of two lies. Liberty, number one, and equality, number two. And we've put these two lies uh, up to people so much that if you call somebody a fascist, it is literally the worst thing you could call somebody. Matter of fact, if you're called a fascist or a Nazi, it's actually worse than being called a pedophile in America. That is the narrative that has been spun. And the bad part about that is that the Vatican II Council and the Novus Ordo Church, they're in line with that. They're in line with that ideology. They're in line with the idea of attacking anything that is pro-family, that is pro-state, pro-faith. And you'll hear this from a lot of people. Right? Bishop Barron will, will famously come out and say that he, he is completely against the idea of the, of the church having any undue influence upon the state. So, so who's actually worse here? <laughs> is it Charles in France or is it Bishop Barron in America in 2021? Because he's part of the church and he's literally saying, I don't want the church to have any, any influence upon the state. You, you have priests who go out on YouTube and they make videos saying uh, clergy shouldn't have anything to do with politics. The church shouldn't have anything to do with politics. So this is that divide. And, and really, who puts this divide into place? Paul VI. Why? Well, for one, Paul VI, he, he got his feelings hurt in Italy. You know, they, they teased him or whatever else. You know, the fascists, they were mean to him. They hurt his feelings and they invaded his safe space. And so he becomes he becomes the pope and he's like, well, now I'm just going to attack you guys because you're mean. So what? Give us give us a little bit of the story on Montini. I know Montini is demoted to Milan by Pius the Twelfth because he's talking to communists against the mm -hmm. orders of Pius the Twelfth. Um, the and you know what? Actually, let's pause on that because there's one objection I needed to raise that I forgot about, and that is, um, the the idea that fascism is really just socialism. Mm -hmm. Um the because after after fascist powers pass away there's a bunch of chaos there's marxists who take over it doesn't produce a lasting system um why are there so many similarities in terms of state state running things between the ussr and mussolini um why isn't it why is fascism not just socialism okay so the biggest the biggest thing is is that fascists don't run industry they 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 influence industry through the use of the guilds right that's that's number one now they didn't use the term guilds they use the term corporations and that's where everybody today gets confused they go oh see it's corporations and the government owns the corporations and blah blah blah, blah. but that's not true they unfortunately just like distributism unfortunately has a really bad kind of stupid name and it and it's very easy to now associate it with with socialism because of the way it's it, it's it's marketed but fascists don't they don't own the means of production they don't want to own the means of production and 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 as we said earlier they don't even want to have ultimate power right what they want to do is they want to look at the state and they want to say i want to be nationalist i want to be i i, I want to love my country it, it, you know the, the problem is, is about 1918, 1919, the term nationalism becomes a bad word, right? If, you, if you're a nationalist, you're a bad person because you don't care about starving people in Africa or whatever else, right? You're, you're, you're mean and all you care about is yourself. The difference between a fascist and a socialist is, number one, the socialists own the means of production, right? I don't care what you say if you go and say, oh, well, it's a democratic socialist republic because – we only really own the charity. We don't actually own the businesses. It's still socialism. You're still owning uh, means of production. Number two, socialists are always looking outside their borders. They are never looking inside. A lot of people will say, well, what about Germany? They're, they were national socialists. 
I think the term with them was kind of more ironic because they weren't socialist in any of their thought process. Um, and they weren't fascist in any of their thought process. Again, the best way I heard it described is that uh, National Socialism was German system created in the 30s and died in 45. And that's it. And nobody really. There was no real underlying crux or anything that held that philosophy together other than the fact that they were completely demoralized people they were poor they had nothing and then here's this guy who comes along creates this system that nobody really understands and nobody really knows and uh that one doesn't hold together but fascism does hold together it holds together in portugal it holds together in portions of south america it holds together in spain until the 1970s uh so it does hold together. And a matter of fact, it still holds together in portions of Italy. There are fascist parties like Casa Pound. Uh, a lot of people in Italy will tell you that Lega is, is partially fascist. Uh, and they would, be, they would be correct on that. There are some, some similarities there. Uh, in Greece, you have Golden Dawn. You have, so you, have, you still have portions of these parties that exist today. Maybe not in the same structure, but they exist. The idea, though, that it's socialism really is just a complete and utter misunderstanding of what socialism is, right? First and foremost, it's the ownership of the means of production. Secondly, it is a system based upon the ideas of liberty and equality. Um, that is socialism. Matter of fact, if you really want to do it, it's the means of production and equality. Those are the two most underlying Term. So it doesn't matter what you are. If you want to go around, like I said, in a suit or the Volkswagen costume on and tell everybody you're a Volkswagen, you can do that in socialism because that's perfectly acceptable. And everybody has to accept you in that way. And fascism would say, you can't do that. Come on. We're not going to allow you to do that. Sorry. Um, unfortunately, what we have in society today is people aren't willing to, to call things a sickness that are a sickness. And so instead of saying this is a sickness and we have to deal with the sickness, we say, no, 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 no. That's that person's right to be that way. And fascism says, hey, you, you don't have a right to be that way. It's deviant. It's disgusting. And you, you either have to be helped or you have to be put into a hospital or whatever. And of course, everybody goes, oh, you mean, uh, you mean one of those happy fun time places? And I, no, that's not what I mean at all. There was only one group of people that had that. And again, th those were the people we talked about, who, by the way, attacked Catholics more than any other group, almost eradicated them to some degree. Right. Yeah, at least in, in, that, in that portion of the world. Yeah. As, as I tried to open this whole show stating that there was a fascist alliance with Dolfus and the prominent, most prominent German Catholic of the mm -hmm. day against Nazism. And what's interesting too, that I read in the biography is that he actually meets up with that one of the line of Habsburg and he, he wants to, cause he's a monarchist actually. He doesn't, he's not really keen on fascism, but he, he sees that fascism and monarchy, at least the monarchists and fascists need to unite against Nazism is, mm -hmm. is what uh, Dietrich von Hildermann thinks at the time. Um, so take us back to Montini. So 1945, the war ends, the communist party is threatening to take over Italy. This is when, I, I can't remember when, what year, I think it was 47, 48, is when Pius XII actually says that it's a, under pain of sin, you need to vote against the communists. Um, and he forbids his, his clergy from speaking to the communists. Mm -hmm. Montini, um, Montini, who is the future Paul VI, does talk with the communists and then he gets demoted to Milan as a punishment of some kind. Um, can you tell us about what is his relationship to fascism and how does that affect his policy later on? Well, he hates it. <laughs> he absolutely hates it because he, he is, he is deep down. He, he is uh, kind of a devotee uh, of the idea of communism. And, and there are uh, a lot of crossovers, right? They like the idea of communism because they, have a, they had then and now uh, a misunderstanding 
of the social encyclical. So they, they look at the social encyclicals as saying something along the lines of like uh, an Alexandria Cortez, right? Everybody deserves to have a paycheck. Doesn't matter what you do. You get a paycheck because you're breathing. Um, you get the, you know, it's, it's Oprah Winfrey, you get a car and you get a car and you get a car and it's all that. And that's what they believe, right? They're really kind of believing that. So they look at fascism as the opposite of that. Cause here's fascism saying, look, you can have all these things, but you got to work for them. You know, so fascism saying you could have all that stuff. You could have the car, you could have the house, but you got to work for them. The state's not going to give it to you. So he doesn't like that. He doesn't like the fact that he's he's being ridiculed uh, in in um, in Italy by the fascists uh, because of he because he he's out there kind of sounding he's sounding like a communist, and that's that that really influences him later on and and brings us to 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 essentially where we are with the church today. So after Vatican II, is Franco really the only fascist power? Or you no. mentioned a few others. Okay, so how does Paul the Sixth interact with fascism? How does he affect things? He doesn't like he doesn't like Salazar. He doesn't like uh, Franco. Uh, he doesn't like what's going on in South America. He's he's really kind of against all that. He he, he doesn't he views it as suppression, right? Because as you said earlier on, you know, like you you got to give up some forms of uh, of freedom and all this and that, and. Largely, this is where we get our ideas about this today is like everything should be free. We should be able to do whatever we want, uh, identify as whatever we want, uh, buy whatever we want, go wherever we want. And the fascists are saying, again, they're saying, no, no, you, you can't do that. You can't. We can't have a free market. We can't send all of our money and resources uh, to other nations. We have to take care of what's here. And he's against that. He, he's completely against that. And that's where you get Francis, right? Francis is against that. He believes that everything should be this global economy, this no borders, a free movement of people and everything else. And he's getting that from Paul the sixth. That's where his, his ideology comes down. Paul the six JP two, uh, to Francis. It's all, it's all. So all how does, same. how does Spain turn out with this? shift of momentum of the church i think largely franco got just beaten down right at some point he just gets so beaten down he says you know what i'm done i'm old uh i'm getting you know toward the end of my life here and i don't want to do this uh you know forever i don't want to have my kid take over or whatever else uh, so instead, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find a king and I'm going to put a king up on the throne and I'm going to retire and walk away. And that's largely what he what he ends up doing. And that's unfortunate because I think I, I think in my in my research of him and others had had come together, uh, maybe reached out to people like Archbishop Lefebvre and said, hey, look, we're behind you. You know what what the church is trying to do is insane. You know, they, they're now going against like the basic, basic idea of the church, which is there's no salvation outside the church. They're basically going uh, and saying that all religion is equal. They're, they're, they're adopting these miserable mistakes of America. Why is Rome all of a sudden now sounding like America? And so they didn't do it, unfortunately. And uh, at this point, you're kind of seeing, I think Vatican II and the lead up to it kind of broke what was left of the fascist leaders. And they just said, you know what? We don't even have the church behind us anymore. Um, the church has left us. And, uh, you know, what do we, what do we have? What do we, you know, where are we going to go? And it's unfortunate because if they stayed around, obviously the SSPX, which by the way, if you go to the SSPX website, their answer to economic ills of society is corporatism. There's a, a wonderful article on the website about that. So um, I think realistically, the only portion of the church that sees the, the benefit of the ideals of corporatism is the SSPX. And it's also one of the few groups inside the church that still rejects the idea of Vatican II. And I, and I, I, I really believe that if these leaders didn't get so beaten down and so demoralized that they could have, uh, they could have affected change and maybe Vatican II would have turned out differently. And we would have had a, you know, 
a different Pope today, but unfortunately that's, that's not what happened. And the church worked very hard to make sure that these guys were out because they did not want these guys. They didn't want that, that I don't even like to use the terms right or left. They didn't want that dissident ideal that the fascists were putting out there. They didn't want that objection to things like equality. They didn't want that objection to things like freedom of religion. They didn't want any of those things to, to affect uh, what they were trying to do with Vatican II. And unfortunately they had to, they had to attack them and I, and they, they were successful, you know, while, while the wars and the economic embargoes and everything else that happened weren't successful, the successful thing to uh, putting them out was a, a liberal church. Yeah, the the only thing I've read on this is David Wemhoff when he discusses how Franco essentially was holding on to a, an earlier concordat where he was able to have some say in appointing bishops, mm -hmm. and Paul the Sixth was pressuring him to renounce that so that Paul the Sixth could just put all the bishops in. And uh, eventually, the bishops and clergy that got put into Spain, many of them were very sympathetic to Marxism and were agitating against Franco mm -hmm. and traditional values. And then international finance took over and eventually destroyed the culture of Spain, as uh, it is that, now. To a large degree, unfortunately, that's a little bit of Franco's fault. Uh, Franco does open up to the free market uh, mainly because he doesn't have a choice, right? Again, going back to the fact that Spain's not an industrial Mecca. Uh, it's largely an agricultural and fishing uh, a country. Uh, so he, he, he has no choice. He has to open up. At least that's what he feels. He feels he has no choice. He has no allies anymore. So he has to open up to the free market. And when he opens up to the free market, it opens up to all these things. And as you, as you rightly pointed out, uh, it opens up to uh, infiltration of the clergy in Spain. And, and the clergy that were uh, friendly to, to Franco are now gone. They're either dead or retired at this point. Uh, and the new ones coming in are not. They're, they're really part of that, that drive to Vatican II. I, I, I'll say this. Vatican II does not only just affect the Catholic Church. It, affected, it ended up affecting nations as a whole. And the shift that the Catholic Church took uh, at Vatican II negatively affected a lot of countries uh, including america excellent and well it, go ahead i was just gonna say this is largely uh the fruits of communism as much as people want to you know not admit it but when you have people as bella dodd rightly pointed out influencing uh the church from a communist standpoint and our, our friends with cardinals and bishops, you know, we we know of a famous communist that that's very friendly. Good the EWTN before they got uh, infiltrated did a did a whole movie on it called them called them the Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for uh, sharing some of this. And uh, any final thoughts on the Christian corporate state? I would say this to people. This is what I would say. And I get these, these emails all the time. Don't be like me. Don't use the term fascism unless you're willing to sit, to really go and, you know, point, put a picture up instead of your face. Uh, unless you're willing to be docs, which I have been, uh, don't do that, but use what you said, use the Catholic corporate state, research it, learn about it. Don't just try to jump into it and go, Oh, I love this. I'm going to go to learn about it, learn the history of it, learn the guilds, learn all that stuff and really get an understanding of what a lot of people were saying. And it was father Heinrich Pesch. It was father Vincent McNabb. It was father Dennis Fahey. Um, those guys are really at the crux of, of the, the Catholic corporate state, even father Cahill to a degree. I, I, I differ with him on some things like women, uh, you know, quality of men and women and stuff like that. But Cahill is, is really kind of one of these uh, corporate Catholic corporate state types too. read those guys, um, learn from those guys. And don't worry about the Mussolini's and the Franco's and the Philippe Batons, unless you, you know, unless you really want to get into the, you know, the political aspects of it, 
then you can learn about them after you learn the secular, uh, the theological, excuse me, aspects of it. Excellent. So Patrick, would you be willing to debate this subject with another Catholic on YouTube? Depends on the Catholic. Fair enough. There's a, there's a couple that I, I, I have come to a conclusion that a debate with them would be uh, just a waste of time. Uh, yeah, that's it's, understandable. Sure. But uh, if, it's, if it's a person that is open, is intelligent, uh, then yes, absolutely. Excellent. Well, um, if, uh, well, actually one, one last thing for viewers, what books would you recommend on this subject? You mentioned a bunch of authors and it, what about titles? Uh, you mentioned the one book that everybody can read from uh, Father Heinrich Pesch, which is uh, Ethics in the National Economy. So obviously go out and read that. Uh, I am working with a, a group of people right now um, to hopefully within this year release uh, ebook copies of the rest of uh, Pesch's works. I'm, I'm actually in the midst of finishing up the uh, permissions for that. Um, Father Dennis Fahey, uh, uh, Money Manipulation in the Social Order, Social Kingship of Christ, uh, Secret Societies uh, and, the, and the Kingship of Christ, uh, all by uh, Father Fahey. Uh, the Church in the Land by uh, Father Vincent McNabb, uh, Cruise of the Nona by Hilar Belloc. Um, those are kind of uh, probably the starting grounds. Economics for Helen, probably another great place to go. Excellent. Well, Patrick, thanks for coming on the show today. Let's offer up an Our Father for all of the difficulties we face, especially the political situation that we're in in America that many other countries are facing today. So let's offer an Our Father to continue to stay strong, strengthen our families and for our children to be safe in this society, to build up a truly Catholic state, which pays homage to Christ the King. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen.